What's going on guys? So this is going to be a really interesting video because I told you guys after I posted the video about the Ford Explorer that we purchased, the pre-owned Ford Explorer 2020 model with almost 30,000 miles and some of the issues we've been having with it and why it went back to the dealership with recalls that hadn't been done, all sorts of little things. At the beginning of that video, I actually put a note that just told folks it's not fair to compare a vehicle or a car or an SUV or pickup truck to an RV in terms of some of the issues that people have. Now, I told you guys I would also follow up with the video explaining what I meant, even though I've kind of talked about this in other videos. So before we dive into this video, I want to make a bit of a disclaimer here, and I want folks who are already kind of up in arms, ready to take down notes and figure out what comment they're going a post saying that whatever excuse I have is BS, I, I want to kind of point this disclaimer at those folks. First of all, I'm not saying that your expectations as a customer buying a product should be different. And when I say that, I understand that if you're paying a lot of money for a product, just like I am, when we bought the Explorer, you don't expect there to be problems. You don't expect something brand new like RVs to have problems. You don't want something that you buy to have problems, especially problems that require it to go back to a dealership for service. So I get that. I'm not disputing that. I'm not even trying to come close to making the claim that when you go and buy something that you spend your hard earned money on, just like I spend my hard earned money on something, I'm not disputing the fact that you do expect it to live up to your standards. You expect it to live up to a certain standard of quality and craftsmanship. And, you know, I don't even think that's different if you are buying something from China or something from another country that's built. You still want it to work and you don't want it to fail. That said, the note at the beginning of that video was to point out a topic that I think a lot of people don't really get when they get into RVing. So let's talk about this. Hang tight. I'll be right back. Okay, so when you are shopping for a vehicle, right, most people do understand the process of building or manufacturing a vehicle, a car, a truck, an SUV. I'm not talking about a recreational vehicle. The thing I've pointed out in the past is that inherently the technology and the planning and the design and engineering that go into a car, truck, or SUV, plus all the safety standards that it has to meet makes the process far more tolerant to finding little problems and fixing them. Makes it very, very precise. Every little component, everything done to manufacture a vehicle is very, very precise. The level of fit and finish that has to go into a car, truck, or SUV is at a much, much greater level. The tolerances have to be much tighter, much closer together because you're going to be in that vehicle. You're going to be driving that vehicle down the road and every little bump, every little thing that you hit on the road can potentially lead to a problem. And car manufacturers know this. They realize that if they don't tighten their tolerances, if they don't make a better product, people just won't buy that product. So your expectations are set at this very high level because again, you're in that vehicle driving it down the road. You're driving the vehicle under conditions that you're directly controlling the vehicle. And because of that, the amount of money that goes into engineering even the cheapest car on the road just completely dwarfs that of any type of RV. So you look at our Brookstone, all right, this Brookstone now carries an MSRP of like $120,000 and a sale price probably closer to like 90 grand. And you compare this to a car or any car, let's compare it to a Hyundai Elantra, you know, a relatively low cost vehicle, entry level vehicle. This RV, from a developmental perspective, from an engineering perspective, from how much is budgeted to the manufacturer to actually design an RV is probably in the thousands. It's, it's not much. It's folks that are sitting in an office trying to figure out what the best design is, who they get parts from, who their suppliers are from, drawing it up, and then saying, will this fit on the frame? Then they send the frame specs off to LCI. They say, yeah, we can build a frame for this. You know, after a couple of weeks go by, they've probably invested a couple thousand dollars into actually designing a new floor plan. Now, when it comes to actually getting everything to work, getting the components and all that stuff, yeah, that's where the price is going to go up dramatically because now you got to source your cabinet makers, your windows, your slide tops, your doors, your awnings, all of your baggage doors, all that stuff. It's really just trying to figure out how you get the components in 
to start producing this product. The next part of it is, is your sidewalls, right? Your sidewalls, they're built in a factory for Forest River, and then they start cutting out the designs. But the pieces are in play to be able to do all sorts of little basic designs to an RV. But almost everything about a towable RV is designed in mind with the fact that we have readily developed components, we have readily developed parts, and we're simply assembling it into this specific type of floor plan or this specific RV you're looking for. From a technology perspective, there's not a heck of a lot of technology that goes into the design of an RV one model year from another or one design from another. Maybe a different front cap, maybe a different cutout. Most of this stuff is just simply a machine cutting holes out and routing different areas so this sidewall and the components fit the next model of RV. RV technology doesn't change very much from year to year. Maybe some of the electronics that get wired into it might change. Maybe some of the things from like smart TVs or you know the ability for you to control your slides through through your phone or things like that. That stuff is kind of newish, right? But it's been around for a long time. Now, if you look at something like a Hyundai Elantra, again, entry level vehicle, probably costs about 20 grand even though you know the vehicle's been out for a long time. You can probably guess that that entry-level vehicle, just one vehicle in the entire Hyundai brand of vehicles, probably costs close to half a billion dollars to produce. Just the engineering, the money that goes into it, the robotics, the things that have to specifically come together to make a vehicle are so much different than that of an RV. And because of that, it inherently needs to change your expectation if you wanna have a decent RVing experience. Again, I didn't say that your expectation should change of you as a consumer. What I'm saying is, is if you wanna understand some of the reasons why RVs are never gonna be at the quality level of a new vehicle, it's because of the money that goes into engineering them, the money that goes into making sure and ensuring the fit and finish, the tolerances are much closer. Again, almost everything is robotically built and robotically assembled. You have to understand that. There are folks that are you know, on the assembly line and they push things together and then they have tools that are specifically set for certain torque tolerances to tighten bolts, tighten fasteners, pop things in place. But all of that stuff was computer built. All of that stuff was designed to have very, very tight tolerances so it plugged in snaps or bolts together in a very specific fashion that does not require a lot of human interdiction the humans basically put it in the right spot and then everything is kind of pre-tightened down to a level that the computer dictates again billions of dollars go into producing vehicles Right, Just designing a vehicle, engineering the vehicle, more money goes into producing and designing a vehicle than probably goes into 20 RV manufacturer lines, more than that even. And because of that, the amount of money that goes into it also dictates how much they can charge for those vehicles and how many they have to sell. I think most people realized when the Super Duty opened up for ordering, I think they reported like 89,000 pre-orders went in in the first week alone. Think about that, 89,000 pre-orders went in in the first week alone. When you're talking about an RV manufacturer building an RV, you're probably talking about a few hundred orders that might go in in a couple of weeks. So again, you're talking about two completely different industries. This is more close to residential construction, but again, that saying that everyone's heard of, Towing an RV down the road is like subjecting it to an earthquake and a hurricane at the same time. There's nothing false about that absolutely nothing false about that and you're doing it to a predominantly wooden interior furniture stuff that's been all put in place by people it's nailed drilled screwed in place by people and then the sidewalls the structure the steel frame all of this also attached by people and it's something that's rolling down the road that weighs between 10 to 20 thousand pounds which is multiple times the weight of most people's vehicles or the vehicle even towing it so at the end of the day, I am not giving a pass to the RV industry, but what I'm trying to get you to understand as folks who watch the channel and folks who are critical about this topic is that you have to understand that an RV and an automotive vehicle are not the same. Think about it this way. If you have a problem with your RV and you take it to an RV dealership, first of all, you really should take it to the RV dealership that actually sells that specific type of RV. There's not 400 RV repair shops scattered all over your city like you see with cars. You can take your car to pretty much whoever you want. A lot of people prefer to take it to the company that actually built the car, but the fact is you don't have to, right? You can take it to one of 400 automotive shops all over the, the, the city you live in or in the county you live in 
versus RVs, you only have pretty much RV dealerships. And then again, it's usually preferred that you take it to the dealership you purchased it from, or at least one that sells the specific brand of RV that you have. So that's a big limiting factor. Next, check out how many folks typically work in a typical RV service shop. You might have two to three mechanics that are there to fix all the RVs that have to come in to the very limited number of RV dealerships that are in your town. So let's say you have 10 RV dealerships and you have two to three technicians that work there. That means amongst all of the RV dealerships in your area, you might have 20 to 30 people, period, that have any idea how to work on an RV. Now, let's look at the automotive industry. Ford, for instance, AutoNation Ford, where we bought our Explorer. If we go to that specific service shop, they probably have 40 people working back there. They have mechanics everywhere, and not all of them specialize in the same thing. Some of them are transmission folks. Some of them are engine folks. Some of them are drivetrain folks. But they have so much more expertise and so many more fields related to automotive care and you can still run into issues. But that's why you can't compare the RV industry to the automotive industry as much as people want to. As much as people want to say, if you know a, a vehicle manufacturer produced a vehicle with as many problems as an RV, they'd be out of business. You're absolutely right. There is nothing wrong with saying that. If a you know automotive manufacturer, Ford, Chevy, General Motors, Ram, whoever, produces a vehicle and it has the type of issues as an RV, first of all, it would probably mean that we've gone back 100 years to where vehicles are pretty much produced and assembled by hand. And it would also mean that the dealership network is very, very limited. You hardly have you know, anybody in your town that knows how to work on vehicles. It would also mean that the budget towards producing the vehicle would have to be stripped almost completely. So that Hyundai Elantra that has a half a billion dollars worth of research and development going into it before they even build one car, will drop that budget to $10,000 and see how nice of a Hyundai or see how nice of, your, of a Silverado or see how nice of an F-150 a manufacturer can produce with such a small budget. Now, a lot of folks would say, well, why don't they put more money into that? Because they don't have the money to put into it, especially when there's 150 RV manufacturers out there. They don't have that type of income. They make good money. They make record profits off of you know RV sales, but it's still a very fickle market because you all have seen RV manufacturers go out of business left and right. They stop producing them left and right. They'll kill a floor plan in a second if that floor plan's not selling. They'll shut down a factory in a second. And it's because they do make good money when they're selling them, but at the same time, they don't have nearly the type of revenue that an automotive manufacturer has. You might look at something like this and be like, well, man, that's a lot of money that they make off of them, but they might only make 20 to 30 of these things a month. So if they're only making that many of them and they're selling them for a certain price and they don't have nearly the margins that vehicles have, Well, then all of a sudden you're running into a scenario where to make the development that some come to be able to invest the type of money that some manufacturers try to like your Airstreams, you know, some of your other high end boutique brands, they try to invest more money into their their designs. But it's very risky because if they can't get the type of return on that investment, they'll go out of business. So. Again, not giving the RV manufacturers a pass because I do understand why an RV can't be built like a car, like a truck, like an SUV. It's just there's no money for that. They don't have the funds to do that. They don't have the funds to put just throw into development the way the automotive manufacturers do. That being said, I do believe that they can fix some of the problems down the assembly line before you experience them. I do get that. Once that RV leaves that factory, though, and... It's hitched up to by whoever's towing it to where it needs to get. A lot of stuff can happen. And that's what you need to understand. You need to understand that when the RV leaves a factory, it's hitched up to a hotshot vehicle or it's put inside of a storage yard and it's waiting for someone with the vehicle, depending on what type of vehicle, can also depend on that ride from the manufacturer to the RV dealership that you may buy it at. A lot of things can happen. And just like when you tow it down the road, a lot of things can happen. The difference is, You own it, you're paying for it, and you're more likely, I would imagine, to treat it with a little more care than a company that's the entire job is simply to transport these things around. Anyways, guys, that is my video in response to the note that I threw up at the beginning of that Ford Explorer uh, kind of tirade I went on relating to some of the issues we had with that 2020 Ford Explorer that, that was in the shop. And I just wanted to give you guys a different perspective on things. 
You know, it's something I've talked about. Again, I'm not giving them a pass. I do believe when you buy a product, it should be perfect. But I've dialed my expectations down to understand that they don't have the budget to make a product perfect. They don't have the budget to develop a product to ensure that it's never going to have a problem or to ensure that the problems are so limited. Because even when you buy a vehicle, you can have problems. That's why lemon laws exist. That's why people with vehicles generally have a way to get out of the situation they're in. And that's why RVs aren't viewed in the same type of criteria or category as a car, because they're constructed entirely different. The budgets are entirely different. The scope, the engineering, the planning is entirely different. And it's all related to money. They just don't have the type of money that the automotive industry has because they don't sell nearly as many of these as vehicle manufacturers sell vehicles. 89,000 trucks ordered in the first week. That's crazy. Imagine what that number's up to now. Anyways, guys, I sure hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't had a chance, leave a comment below. I love hearing back from you guys. And don't blast me. It's not me that makes these decisions. All I'm trying to do is explain the reality of things. And a lot of people don't like being smacked with reality. And I'm just trying to break it down for you. If you struggle with understanding what those differences are, you probably shouldn't buy an RV. Just being honest with you. We'll talk to you again very soon.